Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, and welcome to online worship with Orange Beach Presbyterian Church. My name is Kim. I'm the pastor here. What a joy it is to gather with you this morning for this time of worship together. Just a quick announcement before we begin. You may have noticed at the beginning, right before the prelude, uh, we announce that this uh, is a communion Sunday. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper toward the end of the service. Uh, hopefully you have some elements ready. If not, uh, maybe during the first hymn, run and grab them out of your kitchen. You'll need some bread or some crackers, anything along those lines. And then a cup of juice, a cup of wine, even a cup of water would be good. What's important is your presence at the table. Uh, and speaking of your presence at the table, according to our book of order in the Presbyterian Church USA, all are welcome at the table. However, if you have not been baptized, we would like to issue the invitation to be baptized. If you haven't been baptized yet, and this is something that interests you, please reach out and let us know so that we can begin a conversation about that. You can email the church, you can text me on my cell phone, um, you can speak to one of our elders. All of our information is right on our website. So again, the communion table is open to all, but we would like to issue that invitation for baptism if you haven't been baptized yet. And that is our announcement. Now we are ready for worship. We'll begin with our call to worship and all of the words that you will need today will appear on your screen as you need them. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. We wait and hope for the Lord. God is our help and our shield. In God, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in God's holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, for we put our trust in you. Let us go now into a time of confession. We'll pray first silently, and then we'll pray together in the prayer found on your screen. That will be followed, of course, by our assurance of pardon. Let us pray. And let us pray together. God of mercy, the watch seems long and too often we are distracted, weary, or fast asleep. Lord, awaken us from our slumber. You ask us to be ready to serve you at any time, but we place our commitment on the to-do list of life. We will do these things when we get to them. Forgive our hesitancy and our self-serving ways, O Lord. Heal us of seeking first our own comfort before we engage in acts of justice and mercy. Open our eyes and ears to the cries of those in need 
help us to give, and also to receive ministries of love and reconciliation as we serve you with our whole hearts. Amen. Hear the good news. As far as the East is from the West, so far has God removed our sins from us in Christ Jesus. May the God of mercy, who forgives all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Before we hear God's written word, let's turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, how we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time gathered together, not in the same room, but of the same heart, a heart for you. Lord, we are united in Christ even when we cannot be together physically. So Lord, we just pray with your far reaching hands, with your far-reaching love, that you will reach out and fill each and every one of us with your Holy Spirit, that you will open our ears to hear your word, our hearts to receive it, our minds to understand it. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as together we pray how he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson is from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like people waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
we continue to move through the book of Luke, the story that we read today continues to talk about stuff. If you tuned in last week to a different church, remember I was on vacation a week ago today, so we encouraged our online worshipers to worship with one of our sister churches in this presbytery. They probably too talked about the previous passage in Luke, which was about not worrying about having stuff. Back up even further than that, and we've been hearing about all of this stuff. The story in Luke 12, 13 through 21 is about a rich man who had a lot of stuff that he wanted to keep to himself. And that ends with this admonition. So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Jesus's teachings in Luke 12, 22 through 31 sound like Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. He tells his followers not to worry so much about the stuff of life, what you will eat and what you will wear. That story ends with this admonition. Instead, strive for God's kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Today's sermon text begins with a wonderful promise that we often overlook because we're so anxious about what the very next verse means for our lives and our stuff. Verse 33 says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. But right before that, we hear, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid. God is in control, God is in charge, and it gives God pleasure that God shares the kingdom with us. This is one of those passages which can be taken in some different ways. And we're being told not to worry, we're being told not to be afraid. God is happy to share God's kingdom with us, but it, it also comes with a little bit of discomfort. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. In theory, that sounds good, right? But we make all kinds of excuses as to why we can't really do this. I mean, like all of our possessions, should we all be without homes? Should we all be without anything? Like what kind of stuff do we need to sell? How much stuff? are we allowed to have? We're always very worried about the stuff. Some of you may remember um, a bit by George Carlin where he talks about the stuff. And he says, a house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it. And when you leave your house, you've got to lock it up. You wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some more of your stuff. That's what your house is, a place to keep your stuff while you go out to get more stuff. And sometimes you've got to move, got to get a bigger house so you can get more stuff. I mean, we like the stuff. I'm not trying to tell you that material possessions are inherently evil or wrong or bad, and I don't think that's the message here. But again, we get caught up in the, the fine print on that. We want to be legalistic a little bit. Again, asking ourselves, like all of our possessions? We all have something that we could give up and give that money or that item to the poor? How much is what we're supposed to do? Well, dare I suggest that we ask God. Let us pray to God to find out what we are supposed to give, what we are supposed to keep, what we are supposed to have, and what we might just be able to let go of. He continues by saying, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. What does that mean, a purse that will not wear out? A, a purse that will not ever be empty, a wallet that will not ever be empty, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. No thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's what he's talking about. We don't need to be 
worshiping our stuff. We don't need to be clinging to our stuff to the detriment of our walk with God. We don't need to be hanging on to stuff for bad purposes. Our treasure, our purse that won't wear out, that can't be given away. That can't be exhausted. Nobody can steal it. Remember God saying, nobody can snatch you out of my hand. And no moth can destroy it. There is nothing on earth that can take away the treasure of our heart, our relationship with God, our love of God, and the way God loves us. That is a treasure that really is priceless. It can't be bought, it can't be sold, it can't be stolen, it can't be destroyed. It can change, it can ebb and it can flow, it can grow, and we can walk away from it sometimes. We can get busy and neglect it, but it cannot ever, ever be destroyed. Which leads us to this, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Be ready. We don't know when we will encounter Christ. We really don't know. And that can be taken in a couple of different ways. Number one, we don't know when Christ will return. Even Jesus doesn't know that. Only God knows the hour in the day that we will have the second coming of Christ. Could be five minutes from now, could be five days from now, could be 5,000 years from now. Who knows? Certainly not me, not any one of us. So you could take it that way. Or you could also take it like this. Verse 40, you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. You may encounter Christ in the world in all kinds of different ways. Remember in scripture, we're told sometimes we entertain angels and we're not even aware. Sometimes we see Christ in our lives and we are aware and sometimes we're not. Sometimes Christ takes the form of somebody coming to the food pantry to deliver food or to drop off a donation or to receive food. Sometimes Christ takes on uh, the person who brings somebody else to the pantry to introduce them to our food ministry so that they might also be fed. Sometimes we find Christ in church, in the church leadership, in the person next to you in the pews, in the person who's walking into your church for the very first time. Sometimes we find Christ in a bar, in a supermarket, at work, at school, in our neighborhood. Christ is all around us. We are the hands and feet of Christ on earth. We say that all of the time. So perhaps, perhaps Jesus will come at an hour when we don't expect him. Perhaps that means we encounter and catch glimpses of him every day. So we need to be ready. Jesus gives this example. If you're waiting for your boss to return, you know, you're working in the house and the owner of the house goes to a wedding banquet and they want to be ready for when he returns. And they're not sure. It, he might be coming back at eight o'clock at night if the wedding is boring. He might be having a great time at the party and not come home until 2 a.m. But the point is, it, how happy will the homeowner be when they walk through the door and the house looks great and the servants are waiting and, and they're ready. I always used to laugh when I, uh, when my kids were littler, um, but still old enough to go home on the bus alone. They would go home after school and there was always uh, about an hour or so before I would come home from work um, or, <coughs> excuse me, or Craig, my spouse would be home from work. And so they were alone, but again, they were old enough, you know, 12, 13, 14, so they could, you know, take care of themselves. And um, I would usually text them before I left work and say, hey, I'm on my way home. And I used to laugh when I would do that because I knew the minute I did that, they would be jumping up and scrambling to get done the stuff that they were supposed to have done when I walked through the door. 
I just somehow knew that they didn't get off the bus and immediately dive into their chores. At least I never did when I was their age. You come home, you get a snack, you might watch TV or read a book. Or you... Then you look at the clock, you realize, uh-oh, mom's on her way and you start getting going on your stuff so that it would be ready. Uh, I was just on vacation this past week, so we had some time to visit with my parents and my daughter was with me and she was telling me the story of one afternoon, uh, she wanted to heat up a cinnamon roll in the microwave, so she asked her older brother how long to heat it up and he said 10 seconds and she accidentally put it in for 10 minutes and after a few minutes, it started to make noise and smell burn and she opened up the microwave and smoke just poured out and she hollered for her brother. He grabbed it with tongs. He threw, went outside, he put it in a bucket of water. Smart kids, you know, they knew how to take care of it. They were relieved to, it was outside and in the water they go, they come back in, they open the door and the house is full of smoke. They look at the clock and realize I'm gonna be home in 15 minutes. And they start to panic. They opened up all the doors, they took towels, they were trying to wave the air and get the smoke clear. They wanted to make sure the house would be ready. They were spraying Febreze, everything. This was the first I was hearing about this. I came home, I was none the wiser. House seemed fine, I didn't smell the smoke, they cleared it out just fine. But there was that bit of panic. We know she's going to be home, what are we going to do? The point of being ready that Jesus is trying to share is that you know we don't know when we're going to encounter Christ. We don't know when he's going to return. We don't know when we're going to encounter him in the world. But we need to be ready. There's no looking at the clock and saying, eh, I got time. I'm just gonna chill and really just not do anything because I got time before he gets here. We don't know if we have that time or not. So what do we do with that knowledge? Well, we take his advice. We plan on being ready. Why wait till the last minute? Why wait until you hear that he's coming knowing you might not even hear? So what does being ready look like? What does that mean to be ready for Christ? Well, it means being open to the opportunities that are in front of us. It means focusing every day on where God wants us to be, what God wants us to do. It means treating everyone we meet with kindness, love, dignity, respect. It means approaching each day with readiness in your heart. Maybe begin your morning still in bed or maybe over your, over your first cup of coffee or as you're sitting at the breakfast table or on your drive to work, but just ahead of your day saying, all right, God, I'm going to be ready today. Whoever crosses my path, I'm ready. I'm ready to be the face of God to that person, whatever that looks like. God, today I'm ready for whatever you send me. It means praying and asking God to prepare you. Maybe by reading scripture, coming to a Bible study, worshiping together, singing praises, talking to your Christian friends and your church leaders, your pastor. It means always being open to growth as in your walk, with Christ, that's being ready. And sure, it takes a little bit of work. It takes some intention, but that's why we have these words. That's why Jesus is telling this to his disciples. He's saying, don't worry about your stuff. Worry about God. Worry about what you're doing in this world. Not about what you have, but who you are and how you affect this world. You know, sometimes it feels like we have no effect on this world. It seems like there's all this stuff going on and what could I possibly do? Just one person. But everything we do is, is one little 
pebble thrown into a big pond. But that pebble makes ripples that extend outward. And let me tell you, you throw a pebble in, we all throw pebbles in, after a while, those pebbles start to build up. And in fact, we would change the composition and the look of the entire pond. It's just this little thing here and that little thing there. Everything we do continues us to be ready. Every single thing we do prepares us for the kingdom of God, which we are told is near. So all of these things that we're doing is bringing that kingdom nearer and nearer, making it more and more real for more and more people. Being ready means doing a little bit more to be prepared. This example of being ready this example that he continues on where if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he wouldn't have let his house be broken into. It also means, it means being ready for good, but it also means being ready for bad. It means guarding ourselves against those things which pull us away, which make us less ready. Anything that is distracting to us, anything that is an idol to us, anytime we are worshiping something other than God, anytime our stuff becomes more important than the treasures of our heart. And that can mean a lot of things. There's not one definitive thing that pulls us away. We all have our own weaknesses and we probably know what they are. So being ready also means defending against those things. Because you never know what's gonna come and try to trip you up and pull you away. If we know the thief is coming, we won't let our house be broken into. So we'll be ready. We'll do these things to live the Christian life, the full Christian life. Again, more than just an hour of church on Sunday morning, although don't get me wrong, I love the time of worship. It's one of my favorite hours of the entire week. It is wonderful to worship with the family of God, to sing the hymns that praise God, to pray to God, to hear, to delve into his word. I love all of that. But the whole Christian life is a full banquet. It isn't just one dish. It's all the dishes on the table. It's gathering around the communion table for that one morsel of bread, for that one sip of juice that changes us, that transforms us, that fills us up. That is all part of being ready so that we live the Christian life and we're ready morning, noon, and night, never knowing when we might encounter Jesus, but not worrying about it because we're ready. Not letting the world have its claim on us, on our lives, on our time, on our spirit, but letting God claim that because God claims us. Thanks be to God. And let us now go into a time of prayer praying for and with one another. Let us pray. Gracious God, we have so many blessings, so much to be thankful for. And let us now go into a time of prayer, praying for and with one another. Let us pray. God of grace and God of mercy, we are so thankful for all of the blessings that we have. You heap joy down upon us each and every day. We catch glimpses of you in creation. We have friendships and visits and family. We have smiles throughout the week. 
We celebrate things and you're right there with us. You're smiling with us. You're celebrating with us. You take delight in our joy and we give you thanks for all that you do and all that you are. For your steadfast love, we are ever grateful. But Lord, that steadfast love is also present when we are feeling sorrow, when we are angry, frustrated, when we find it hard to cling to hope because of the events around us. You're right there with us then too. You walk every path with us, even when it's a difficult journey, especially when it's a difficult journey. You pick us up and carry us when it seems like we cannot put another foot forward. You often do that by sending people here to do that for us, doctors and nurses, friends, loved ones, family, caregivers, church family. And we give you thanks for all of those people who are doing your work on earth. Lord, we pray for all of those people who are sick in mind, in body, or in spirit, and we pray that they will be healed. We ask for you to look after the healers, the scientists and researchers, the doctors and nurses, the therapists and counselors, all of those people who need some healing. We know that you are the great physician. Reach a hand down, lift up those who are the healers here and touch those who are sick. Comfort their families who worry. Be with those who are grieving. We pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We gather at the table from near and far, separated by distance, but united in Christ. And indeed, this is Christ's table. This table doesn't belong to the church. This is the Lord's table. And your tables in your homes right now, they've ceased to be your tables. Those two are tables of the Lord. And all belong here. All are welcome to feast, to taste and see that the Lord is good. When it is time to serve, if there are other people in your household, serve one another. As you serve the bread, you'll say, this is the bread of life. As you serve the juice, the wine, the water, you'll say, this is the cup of salvation. We will all eat at the same time, eat together, and we will all drink together. And now, let us begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, how we thank you for these gifts, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. And we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit out upon these gifts, that we might be joined together as we remember your son, we hold on to our family. We hold on to our faith community. And we share in this meal together. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to do her work. We pray for this meal that we are about to join together to eat. And we pray it in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus sat with his disciples. They sat at table and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he poured it, saying, this is a new covenant written in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink this, remember me. And indeed, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, 
we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take your bread. Take and eat. This is the bread of life. And the cup, this is the cup of salvation. Drink and remember. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this meal. It may seem like a tiny morsel but it is like the widow's gift. It is just a small part, but with huge meaning, life-changing meaning. We thank you that this taste of bread, this sip from the cup, is a meal that we share with you in remembrance of you and for your glory. We are thankful, and we pray that this meal will nourish us, will fill us up, so much that we are overflowing with your love, that it might be visible to the world around us. We pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. This concludes our worship service. We thank you so much for joining us today and I hope to see you again next week. Don't forget, we also have a Thursday evening prayer service that takes place on our Facebook page only. Uh, and that's at 7 p.m. every Thursday night. It's about 15 minutes long, so it's relatively quick. Um, but there is a time of scripture and music. There's a time to share your joys if you would like or your concerns so that we all might be praying for and with one another. I hope that you will join us. But for now, we're parting ways. We'll close our computers, turn off our phones, and we will be ready out in the world, ready to encounter Christ. Be excited, be bold as we do this. For as we part ways, we go with God the Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.
And the children of the Lord said, Amen. Amen.